Okay, let's circle a little more on the mix of questions. The Bible's really pretty clear, but just like any other book, what you get out of what you read really depends on what you already know. If I were to open up a chemistry book, I have almost no knowledge of chemistry. I've always been interested to study it, and I have quite a number of textbooks which I've never read. I collect textbooks like most women collect jewelry. So when I open up a chemistry book, even if it's a primer, my eyes are going to glaze over. And for sure, I'll misread the text. I would have to read it over and over and over and stop and think about it and go on Google and learn a lot of the vocabulary. And it all in doing all of that, the whole time, I am dependent on who I listen to, as it were. And if I just go to a forum on chemistry and I read the posts and I assume that everybody talking in those posts actually knows what they're talking about, I won't know if they're giving me bad information or not. The same is true of a textbook. Granted, there are certain standards for textbooks, and we want to believe that what we read in a textbook has been, you know, somehow vetted, and that the person who's writing it actually knows what he's talking about, but the fact of the matter is that's not true. You can read hundreds of textbooks on world history, And in every single one of them, the date of the Exodus is wrong. I have my high school textbooks from on world history. I want to say that the actual textbook that I have is like a year or so after I was actually in school. But it places the Exodus during the time of Ramses, which of course was also the movie the movie, The Ten Commandments. Scholarship on the Ten Commandments was abysmal. It was not the time of the Ramses, it was Amenhotep II. The same thing is true in my world history textbook. That's what it says. That's a hundred years, sometimes two hundred years, depending on which Ramses you pick, later. Which is astonishing that the scholarship would be so bad because the Ramses kings were famous for erasing the cartouches and putting their own names on it. In other words, they would deface the historical record, which in those days they did it in buildings. A cartouche is a sort of, oh, what do you want to call it, name plate. Hi, this event took place in this time. It's really complicated, the hieroglyphics and everything. But the point is, is that they were famous and known to be famous by scholars for erasing history and putting their own name on it. And yet, kids like you and me were taught that it was under Ramses that the Exodus took place. Now, the actual basis for that argument is based on an imprecation by a guy named Minerpta. Condemning the Jews. That's the only thing it's based on. That's pretty sad, isn't it? Bad scholarship. The Jews, of course, have fallen in with this common idea made popular by the movie The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, which, of course, it's very impolitic to dislike. All that false scholarship has been sitting around here for 50 years. Same thing as the Star of Bethlehem 
Bible never says there's a star of Bethlehem. Now, I'm drawing two analogies here. I'm drawing an analogy between accepted scholarship, which is bad and wrong, and keeps on being accepted and taught, with the ignorance of the person getting that information. Now, when we go to school, we get textbooks. We have no idea how accurate or inaccurate those books are. And when you go on the internet or you listen to me or anybody else, if you're not already knowledgeable about the subject, you don't know if what you're hearing is true. This is why I made 72 videos against the King James Only people. They're lying to you. All of them. Top to bottom. They cannot read the Greek and the Hebrew to know if the King James is a good translation or not. So they're lying when they say that it's inspired. They're lying even when they say it's a good translation because they can't read the original from which it was translated. They wouldn't know if the original they're looking at has mistakes in it. But that doesn't stop them from making claims. But if you don't know anything about the Bible or the Greek, or the Hebrew, or the King James, and you're getting this information from somebody you don't even know who it is, and you have no ability to discern the information, then you're going to be making decisions based on bad information you don't know is bad. Now, that's going to happen to all of us. That's how we all grow up. This is a common problem to humanity. It isn't necessarily with respect to Bible. It's on any other topic. Any topic at all you want to name. About 90% of the information that's out there commonly heard is, a, is incorrect. But you can't know that unless you already know a lot about it and already have done a lot of homework. This is why I get nasty with people. There's just too much sloppy scholarship in Christendom and everywhere else. And people just spout things off as if they were true. And they actually don't know. They have no personal knowledge of the subject. They haven't done their homework. Now why does that happen? And what are the ramifications and the effects? I'm talking both generally and with respect to spiritual life. Generally, to the extent that you don't know what you're talking about, that you're relying on the hearsay of someone else, and you assume they know what they're talking about, but you don't personally know if they're right or wrong, then you're passing on information. You don't know if it's true. You don't know if it's right. You don't know if it's correct. And therefore, you are childish with respect to that topic. Childish. You are also arrogant because you're talking about something based on hearsay that you don't know is correct and might as well be gossip. So childishness and arrogance. Childish in that you do not have, what, what are children like? Okay, they're ignorant. They cannot discern. They're simplistic. They paint things in black and white. They have a short attention span. And another thing about children is that they get peevish very quickly. So imagine being childish on a topic, but you're not a child. You're physically an adult. How mature is your handling of things you don't know? Well, depends on how vested you are in the topic. Does it make you feel important Do you have to be right? 
How interested are you in doing your homework? That's a measure of how interested you are in the topic rather than interested in something else and rather than interested in your ego. To the extent that you're not interested in a topic, then you will be childish on that topic. To the extent you pontificate on a topic you don't know anything about, you're also arrogant on that topic. I hope you can see the parallel. It applies to any topic at all. But it especially applies to topics regarding the Bible. So here you and I are, we spout off, and I'm no less guilty than anybody else, we spout off on topics of whatever topic it is during the day, and what's the mix of real information we've really done our homework on versus hearsay we get from somebody else and snap judgments that we make and snap things we say? What's the mix of that? And God's hearing it all. And especially when it comes to the Bible. How do we talk about it? How interested are we really in God's Word? Really interested. Not, oh, I, I need to make myself look good to myself, so I'm going to chirp praises about the Bible. Well, you're not praising the Bible, and you're not praising God, and you're not even honest before God if you don't know what it says. And you don't know what it says if you haven't studied it. And you haven't studied it unless you've studied it in the original languages. And even then, you haven't studied it unless you've been using 1 John 1, 1 9 and you've been doing it for some years. You don't know what it says. You're living instead on hearsay. That's how we grow up as kids. You're five years old, mommy tells you something, and you believe mommy. You don't know any better. You can't exercise critical thinking yet. You're just starting to learn how to make a sentence. When you're ten years old, you can do a little bit better, but you still have no discernment, and you're still largely depending on what everybody tells you things are. Okay, at that point, you've had ten years of other people telling you things, and you assume them true. And you don't even understand what you've been told. But all that programming has been built in you. By the time you're 15, you already have the hormones to want to pull away from your parents. That's normal. You're trying to become a person in your own right and trying to become depend independent. But you're still very dependent, and so you gravitate from your depending on your parents and that hearsay to peer pressure with other teenagers. It's the number one problem that teenagers have between 15 and 30. The urge to fit in and go along. And whatever the group says, that must be true because you're looking for an alternative hearsay dependency from the one you had with your parents. You're trying to become a person yourself and so you gravitate to some other object that you believe in, no matter what they say. And so whatever your group says, whatever group you belong to or you join, whatever your group says, you're going to say the same thing and you're really not going to be exercise critical thinking about it. You're just going to go along. And that keeps on going on roughly until time about, about roughly until a person is thirty. Uh, the it, it's not universal that it happens, but the pressure works that way. Um, about the only time you can get any kind of true independence prior to thirty is if you have a lot of trauma in your life and you end up spending a lot of time alone. That's about the only exception. And there are a lot of people who have that kind of trauma. One of the sources of trauma that is typically and actually used on purpose is military service. That's what it, part of its purpose. It teaches you to fit in a group and at the same time teaches you to think for yourself. Depends on the country and their, their style of military. The U.S. is kind of known for emphasizing independence in its military. You are supposed to think for yourself. 
that's what distinguishes the American military from other forms of military, although American military isn't the only one that's like that. The Israeli military is very much like that, encouraging initiative. Most other military organizations, are, they're more, they discourage initiative more, but there are exceptions. The point is, is that usually in your 20s, if you're doing military service or you have some kind of, you know, especially problems with your parents when you're younger. Most everybody has problems with their parents when they're in their teens. That's pretty normal. It's not, it's a mix of the parent and the kid's fault. Because both the parent and the kid have trouble adjusting to the independence. Because the, the parent got used to the kid being dependent and now that's not happening anymore. It's very upsetting. At both ends. So the, the, there are, there are, if, trauma occurs, um, what do you want to call it, opportunities to gain a more mature independence. But it's, it's, it doesn't, it's not usually enough. Beginning about 30, most people are married at that point. They, their marriage is starting to have problems, big ones. They have one or two kids. And those kids are usually five to ten years old, and the, that's when a sort of awakening begins to occur. That's when a lot of divorces start to occur, too. And by 40, there's a little more independence, and then it's usually around 45, 50, that a person starts to actually mature and be his own person. Actually starts to think for himself. Now, when I say usually... Um, that's still not a very big percentage of a population. There's still, people who are actually independent thinkers are maybe, oh, 30% or less. In order to get a higher job, you have to become an independent thinker. Okay? But there, it does happen. It's about 30% of the population. But even with that, there is so much fitting in that's done. That by and large, this herd-bound instinct of humanity doesn't break. And what am I trying to get with all this? I'm trying to tie the lines together to show how childishness and arrogance, which are born of ignorance, okay, and lack of discernment, People don't grow up inside their heads. I'm not talking necessarily emotional, but it's a mix. The, the hallmark of maturity is that you can think for yourself. You analyze for yourself. And when you say something or think about something, you actually analyze it yourself. You don't just spout off what everybody else is saying. You don't just spout off the hearsay that's around you. Now, all of us are doing this spout off the hearsay stuff about stuff we know nothing about. It's a sort of shorthand and it's a sort of convenience. It's a very dangerous thing to do. Of course, it depends on the topic. But we all express ourselves really based on what others say. There's very little original research going on and it's particularly bad in academia of every discipline. Every single field of academia is completely herd-bound. Christian scholarship is absolutely abysmal. Absolutely horrible. The scholars just follow each other. In fact, they're required to do that to even get a PhD. All a PhD means is that you were able to summarize what all the scholars in your field said. That's all it means. Original research is frowned on. Not universally in all disciplines, but it's generally frowned on. You're supposed to fit in with your peers. So, academia is very childish and arrogant. Everybody going on what everybody else says. So, if that's what we hold up as respectable, the academics, who are just parrots then you can bet that the rest of society is just as childish and arrogant as academia. This is very well known in academia, okay? 
Everybody laments it. They've been lamenting it for for years. Okay? And the trend keeps going on for years. Now, what that leads to is that what you think you know about God, what you think you know about life, is largely based on hearsay. So it's time to ask yourself, you know what? Do I really want to live like this? Now, your typical human being is going to live like that. Your typical human being is very comfortable being childish and arrogant and living on hearsay. It gives you warm fuzzies because he fits in with the majority opinion. And that to him is God instead of God. So, that's why we have war. Because people can't stay childish and arrogant for too long before they want to fight with each other. But more seriously, war because you just can't avoid it. More seriously than the war question is the fact that you're living your life like a sleepwalker. You're just living on everybody else's opinions. Too lazy to do your own homework. Too unconcerned about the real value of life and the rightness or wrongness of a thing. Might makes right, majority makes right, mass makes right is the thing you're going by. And it's a habit for all of us, it's endemic. It all goes back to the garden when Adam took the fruit from the woman. He had to choose between another human and God, and look what happened. And that's the same game that's been going on ever since. The number one evil in Christianity and everywhere else is that we're putting people where God belongs. The first commandment is totally disregarded. Now, what that ends up meaning is that nobody matures as a human being or spiritually until they learn to sequester or reduce the people emphasis. When you hear somebody say, oh, I'm a people person, that person is childish and arrogant and you can't trust them. Because that's the third thing that goes along with this. Anybody who's just following a crowd is fickle, has no loyalty whatsoever because all they care about is, is fitting in. When I hear somebody say, oh, I'm a people person, and that stupid song that was sung by Barbara Streisand, people who need people are the luckiest people in the world, no. Christ was a loner. And we all know he was the most mature. Every Bible hero in the Bible book in the Bible books, from Genesis to Revelation, was a loner. It doesn't mean you have to be antisocial. In fact, that that's also being immature. You know, the, the hermits, the Geneva crowd, the Mormon crowd, anybody. Oh, we're going to separate our book, our group, from everybody else in order to be holy. They're more childish than everybody else. It's harder to be your own person in a group and to have no loyalty to anything but what's the truth. That's what makes for maturity. And it doesn't happen. So it's far more serious than war, and far more serious than, you know, just being a herd-bound sheep, is that you end up living like you're dead. You might as well be walking dead. Because you're not really living for yourself. You're just walking to somebody else's tune. 
And a lot of people kind of realize that and they try to rebel. Whatever my mother was, my father was, is also a trend of history. Whatever my mother was, my father was, my group is, I'm just going to rebel against it. You know, the, the kid who's born into a rich family wants to go work for the Peace Corps and become a liberal. Well, that's just as much herd bound as anything else. True independent thinking means that you actually value the intrinsics, the pros and cons of any idea or proposition. There is something good and something bad about every single idea. There's something good and something bad even about God. What's good about God is that he's total, but that's also what's bad about him. I'm not saying God is bad. I'm saying that the relationship has going to have a problem. Because of the totality of God versus us. Totality means that he is so totally righteous that he allows maximum unrighteousness to exist. He actually ensures it. To us that seems immoral. It certainly seems immoral to Satan. It's Satan's number one argument in the trial. So, as you go along in this, knowing that we're going to war, what do you do about it? Live and learn on Bible, like I said in the last increment. But really more even important, now, well not more importantly than that, as importantly as that, you need to cultivate the habit of thinking independently. When there's an idea in your head, what's good about it? What's bad about it? And yeah, because it's a, that is the way we all think. Well, we first start going by other people's opinions. But then you have to examine your own premises. Why did God do what he did? A lot of people aren't even comfortable analyzing that question and don't even know how to analyze it. Because that seems, oh, I'm questioning God. No, you're not. God is the God of truth. So what's the truth about it? Do you know? Why have a relationship with God if you don't know him? Why have a relationship with God if you don't know why he wants what he wants? You see? We're, we're just sleepwalking through this Christian God thing. You need to be independent. You need to learn and live on Bible, all right. But you need to analyze the intrinsics. I mean, we do this routinely. I go to the grocery store and there's 16 different brands of tomatoes. Which one should I buy? One's cheaper than another. One's got more potassium than another. One's packaged in, in white lined cans. That's the best way to get them. Red gold, for example, is packaged in white lined cans and that tends to reduce the acid, the acidic content. Tomatoes taste better. Okay, but that's a lot of facts you have to know even about a can of tomatoes versus some other can of tomatoes. Do you buy it just because it's cheapest? Well, then that's poor analytical skills. I mean, maybe that's all you can afford to do. But you shouldn't just go by price. You should go up by price versus features versus product quality versus, you know, a whole bunch of other factors that go into it. Same thing with a computer, buying a car. And we all kind of know we ought to do that kind of reasoning. And you know what? We don't do it. We're too lazy, too much in a hurry. Sometimes it's not warranted. But you have to argue that it's always warranted when it comes to the Bible. Are you doing it? Learning and living on Bible does not mean that you memorize 16 Bible verses today. Or you spent your hour listening to the pastor talk and whew, now my laundry chore is done. I can close the book and go on. Same attitude that we have in school. Okay, well I sat through my class. I sat through six periods of class. I took my notes. Now I can close my book and go have fun. Did you learn anything? Did you learn anything about God today? Do you understand it? That's the best defense against herdbound. 
the best defense against childishness, the best defense against ignorance, the best defense against pod, you know, pontificating about something you don't know anything about, and the best defense against war. The one number one thing about war is the same number one thing about crime that all the liberals are too arrogant to even think about. If you're tougher than the guy who wants to attack you, he won't attack you. If you got a gun in your house and you're responsible about learning how to fire it, And there's some kind of knowledge that you know how to do that. In other words, your neighbors or whatever, they're aware that, yep, I know how to fire a gun. Then your neighbors aren't going to attack you. Same thing with, you know, preparing for, you know, you, you don't just lock your doors. You do other things to protect your, your belongings. A thief needs things to be quick. Uh, somebody wants to hurt you needs things to be quick. And I was learning, you know, um, karate when I was in, you know, in college. It stood me in real good stead when I had to walk across the campus at night. I got attacked a couple of times. At least once, I want to say twice. And because of what I learned in karate... The guy who attacked me, he didn't get anywhere. You see, if you're prepared, you can fight. If you can fight, then nobody's going to fight you. It's especially true in the head. If you're prepared with knowledge, then all these temptations and doubts and concerns and tiredness... They can't fight you as well. And you have to learn and want to fight all the time. It's very tiring. But if you don't do it, then war will come. And you lose. And the biggest war you're in is the war of life. You wake up in the morning. What are your decisions based on? Hearsay? Popular opinion? Which is always wrong. Did you analyze the subject yourself? Do you know what a thing is? Can you discern good from bad on a topic? How are you living your life inside your head? Before God. But equally, really, because it's how God wants it. That was a big surprise for me. For yourself. You. Live. Right now, you're alive, your soul. What are you thinking? Are you doing yourself a favor by just living on hearsay? What are your premises? What are they based on? And God does want that. His whole, and this is the thing that surprises me about him the most. And you can ask him, you know, for verification, which I expect you to do for everything I say. Don't just take it, you know, on faith because brain out says it. You're supposed to analyze everything I say. That's why I do so much. Ask God this question, because he's always doing this to me. Why do you like our existence? Because I ask him that every day. And it's always the same thing. He wants the relationship. It's not about being little Miss Goody Two-Shoes. He wants the relationship and he wants it at his own level. It's, I, I don't have to be equal to him to have a relationship at his level. That's the surprising thing. He can process the information in my head if I want it. So the question only revolves around how much do I want. And he loves giving the information. And he loves the processing. And he loves to see us learn it. And he loves to see us think about the same issues the same way. That's his level. 
When you're growing kids, you love it when they finally start to grow up enough where they can reason on their own. And they start grappling with the same issues you already know. It's a joy to see them independently think and independently care about the same issues you do without any coercion from you. That's what he gets out of it. It's not a performance thing. It's an experience thing. It's a, it's a fellowship thing, really. Just like you would have with somebody, I don't know if you've ever mentored anybody or if you've ever parented, but it's, it's like that. You go to a lot of trouble to give somebody information. And you're doing it because you want them to enjoy it. You want them to mature in it. You want them to have the experience of it. Because obviously you like the information. You're living on it already with all of your discernment and knowledge. And it matters to you. And you know it would matter to them if they understood it. So you want them to get the understanding. That's what God wants. That's what's in it for him. And so, you know, I, I can't speak exactly for how he does it with you, but I bet it's similar. Whenever I go to talk to him, which is, you know, in my head, and a lot of times I avoid him because it's really uncomfortable to know this truth, okay? Because it's so intimate. Even when I'm going, going for, like, breakfast, and I've said this many times, but it's like the heart of the whole story. What do I eat for breakfast, Dad? What do I eat for dinner? It's not about the breakfast or the dinner. It's about the relationship with him. Analyzing any question, no matter how small. Because it's the relationship that's going on then. And then he always comes back to me, what's good about it, what's bad about it. And what's really happening there? It's not about what I ate for breakfast, whether I picked grape nuts and oatmeal mixed with whey protein, which is often the answer. It's not even about getting the answer right. It's about having a conversation. Bible gives you the ability to have a conversation with God. To know how he thinks, to know why he thinks, to know what he thinks. It's a whole matrix of thinking. As my pastor liked to say, it's the Old Testament is the thinking of Christ as God, and the New Testament is the thinking of Christ as humanity. And that was kind of simplified, but he was trying to, you know, give us a frame of reference. It's a basis for a conversation. It's the way God thinks. Okay, fine, but you know what? The Old Testament's kind of obscure. It's, it's basically presented with a whole lot of metaphorical stuff. And you get all these stories about people. What do those stories teach you? I'm not real good at that part. I have to talk to him all the time about that. What? A, okay, so the, uh, David was 30 when he got crowned. He was 77 when he died. So why do I need to know that information? What is that telling me? And then he goes to the Jebusites here and he has this thing happen then. And, that, and it's like, I'm, you know, I'm not real good with physical events. Like, I don't understand what's so important about that. You know, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. So, I'm good with principles, but, you know, historical facts, and this happened to this person when, this is this person's name, this is that person's name. What does that mean? Well, the Bible in the Old Testament is a lot, it's presented like that. In the New Testament, it's like one principle after the next, really easy to understand. And real easy to use. Old Testament, well, that's not so easy. See, it's a, it's a matrix of thinking. God is showing you two ways to think. And you get enough information in your head and you got a whole picture. And you can actually see him. But he, but he wants you to do the analysis on your own. The Holy Spirit, of course, is constantly mentoring you. But they're not interfering. That's the difference between fitting in with God and fitting in with people. If you're fitting in with God, it's, it's analysis, 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 and you actually become stronger, more mature, and more independent, even of God. Because that's how he wants it. He wants equals. 
And even though by nature we are never equal to him, the thinking pattern and thinking level can indeed and is designed to be equal to him. That's why the Holy Spirit runs it. The Holy Spirit is equal to Father and Son. So it is on God's playing field. Now, you don't know that when you're a kid. You don't know that if you're living on hearsay. You don't know that if you're not interested in learning Bible enough. So then you live in this, like, shadow world. That's how the book of Hebrews talks about it. Or like the movie Matrix, where the life you think you're living is not really the life you're living at all. It's all imagined. And it's very shallow. So ask yourself this question. It couldn't be more important. Do I want to just go with the crowd and live on hearsay and therefore be childish and arrogant and ignorant and a sleepwalker through life? And have that same set of problems, restrictions with my understanding of God and the Bible? Or do I want to be my own person? doesn't mean necessarily rebelling against society. Some ideas in society are really good and important. And teamwork is important, and loyalty up and loyalty down is important. But the boundaries are very sophisticated. And above all, it's God instead of people. Okay, but you're living in the world with people. So how do you, you know, manage those boundaries? What are they? Well, that's a lot to analyze. Do you want to analyze them? Do you want to be your own person? Do you want a personal vertical relationship with God? And to really know Him? Not because your ego needs it. Not so you can say you're a good Christian. Because that's totally irrelevant. Christ paid for you, you're saved, end of story. Now what? Well... What do you want? Now, if you don't think about that too deeply, you're going to think, well, that's being selfish, brain out. What do I want? Yeah, it is about what you want. It's your soul. It's nobody else's soul. God made you to be independent. And by the way, if you really want to do a good deed for humanity, that's the only way to do it. Because if you're herd bound, honey, you're going to be trapped by Satan. All herd bound people are. You're going to be childish. You're going to be ignorant. You're going to be arrogant. You're going to be going along with the crowd. And you're going to be telling yourself how holy you are because you do. And Satan's got you right where he wants you. Just like he did to the woman going to her first instead of to Adam. Is that the way you want to be? Like Adam taking the hand from the taking the fruit from the woman? Because that's what you're doing if you're not an independent thinker. And you know, if you if you if you hear someone or you yourself say, I'm an independent fruit thinker, I'm a free thinker, I'm a good person, I'm a fun loving person. You're not any of those things. If you have to tell me how free and independent you are, you're not. If you have to tell me you're good, you're not. If you have to tell me that you love Christ, then you don't. A thing is or is not, and whatever it is, is manifest. Anything that trumpets what it is, isn't. So think for yourself. Where do you want to be? Who do you want to know? Why? What's good and what's bad about all the ideas in your head? And can you discern? Can you analyze? Or are you just living with the crowd on those ideas? That's your call. Nobody else can make it for you. But I submit to you, because I got the same problem. We live on hearsay too much. 
And to the extent we do, we're all going to war. We're all going to lose because we're all in Satan's camp. That's kind of sad, huh? To be sleepwalkers in Satan's camp, ignorant, childish, and arrogant. Because why? Because we don't want to think for ourselves and question and audit our premises? Peace out.